Welcome to the Changing Earth Podcast with Sarah F. Hathaway. Blending survival, fiction, and fact to bring you entertaining education that will help you dream, survive, and thrive. And now, here's your host, Sarah F. Hathaway. Hello, it is good to have you back here on the Changing Earth Podcast. Today is an exciting day for me. I get the honor of welcoming the other James in my life. This is James Talmadge Stevens, better known as Dr. Prepper. And I got to tell you, this guy has a definite spot in my heart. When I first uh, started with my book, I went on a virtual book tour where I went and appeared on blogs and things like that. And then I found out about podcasts, which is what I'm doing right now, make my own podcast. But I learned about virtual podcast tours. So I decided it would be a great way to take my book and really get it out there to lots of people who would be interested in reading it. And so when I started out in the world of podcasting, I started researching podcasts and asking them rather awkwardly if I could appear on their show. Dr. Prepper, James. He reached out to me and welcomed me to his show. He doesn't usually do fiction books, but he read my book. He really liked it, and he agreed to have me on. And I was so honored and so tickled silly that he would reach out and take this um, no-name author. People don't usually go for fiction authors on their podcasts, you know, so I was so honored that he would reach out to me. So I just want to give him a special welcome. He is the author of Dr. Prepper's Making the Best of Basics Family Preparedness Handbook. And I'm telling you, this is a great resource. Um, he is so simple about his um, plan of attack for being prepared, yet he gives you so much information. It's like, you know, a dictionary of great online resources, fill in the blank sheets that you can use to get your life all in order. And I'm telling you, it, it's so, he makes it so simple, so neat, so clean, and it's just a great resource. So I really suggest that you pick up Dr. Prepper's Making the Best of the Basics Family Preparedness Handbook. So today, and the day after disaster story, we have some good things going on that are really going to get exciting. So with that in mind, I want to go ahead and get right into the story so I don't keep you waiting, and then we'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Prepper. Day After Disaster by Sarah F. Hathaway, Chapter 9. Erica went on living with Carol and Henry for a couple more weeks. Every day, Erica grew stronger and stronger, but each day she also grew more and more anxious to leave. She knew her family would be waiting, and she knew she would have to go to them soon. How long would she wait if the shoe were on the other foot? If she was safe at home with Dexter, how long would she wait and wonder if Vince was alive or dead? She didn't know. That's why she knew she had to go. Erica was never much of a morning person, and usually... Carol and Henry were up long before she was. One day she woke up to a great commotion. Harold had finally arrived with Betsy and the kids. They were all healthy and came with four more horses. They also brought some supplies that the household badly needed, like rice and sugar. Although their coming was a very joyous occasion, Erica was feeling like a third wheel and could not help but feel that her place was not here. The hugs and tears flowed that day and Erica was distraught. All she could focus on were the hugs of her own family and how much joy they would share when she returned home. All day they shared food and stories. The first story was how the family had fared during the quake and how their journey to Henry and Carol's had been. Harold and Betsy told the story marvelously. One would literally finish the other one's sentence, and you could feel the love was thick between them. They said that when the initial quake hit, the family had been outside, and their house and barn were destroyed instantly. Luckily, they and the horses had been outside, and everyone was all right. They had no idea what to do, and they, like most people in California, waited for help that would never come. While they were waiting for some kind of help, 
they started pillaging what goods they could from their destroyed home. They built a temporary shelter and stored the goods there. They also started looking for neighbors. Unfortunately, they only found three people that were still alive. They waited in makeshift survival shelters with the others they had found until stocks began to run desperately low. Then it was decided that they would disband to look for their families more supplies. It was quite evident by then that help was not on its way and everyone had different priorities. Harold and Betsy's priority had been to get to Harold's parents since they were the closest relatives. Betsy's parents still lived in North Carolina. Betsy said she was praying that they were safe and Erica understood her pain only too well. Betsy's thoughts of her parents made Erica think of her own mother and father. She sent a silent prayer out to them and hoped they were safe and in good hands. Her immediate focus had been on her husband and son. There was just too much misery to think of everyone she loved at once. It could drive a person mad. The conversation then shifted to lighter issues. Harold and Betsy's oldest daughter, Jen, who was 15, told all about what had been happening in school and how their basketball team had been doing so great this year that it really was a shame all this had to happen. Her younger sister, Kim, who was 11, and spoke loudly so her older sister would not interrupt, told all about how she was a champion horse jumper and was very excited about nationals this year because she was going to be a part of the Junior Olympic team. She didn't know if there would even be a nationals now, but was very excited because she got to ride her horse here just like in the Old West. Then it was Rob's turn to tell his story. He was only nine and spoke very softly. He was so cute and was very annoying how his sisters broke in to finish his sentences for him. In the end, Erica heard all about how he loved to play soccer and was going to Harvard one day and would play soccer there just like his dad had done. It was nice to talk of normal things, but at the end of all the stories were the same questions of, would it still be there? Or would the event still happen? Erica even wondered if a school as old as Harvard could have survived this nightmare. But like most other things, Harvard was gone. The earth had swallowed up the university and any person inside went right with it, to a grave in the newly opened earth. After dinner, Henry played a song on his fiddle, and out came the cognac again. After the song, Carol and Betsy put the kids to bed. Harold and Betsy were sleeping in the room between Henry and Carol's and the bathroom. The rest of the kids would be sharing the bedroom next to Erica's room. Once the kids were in bed, Carol and Betsy came back to the table, and the subject changed to more pressing issues like supplies. Harold and Betsy had to leave the other livestock they had behind because it would have been too arduous to make the trip with them. They gave them to the folks that were staying behind at the survival camp, waiting for their own families. It was decided that it was a good decision because they only had one stall of hay left, and now there would be four more horses to feed. The garden was still going to produce well, besides having a few new grooves in it. There were babies on the way. The cows, sheep, and goats all had pregnant females. They would only kill the adults as needed, so they would always have meat. The only question was, how would they sustain a feed supply for the animals with all the feed stores closed? Erica couldn't help but feel guilty during the conversation. She was feeling better again. She knew she was just a drain on the family resources, and she was taking up precious space that the family needed. She decided that it was time for her next journey to begin. She knew Carol would protest her leaving and decided to go quietly at night while everyone was sleeping. As her decision became finalized in her mind, she looked up, and Henry was staring right into her soul. They both know what she had been thinking, and Henry simply looked over to a saddle and a horse pack. Erica knew he was giving her permission to take that saddle, and she began to go over supplies in her head. She knew she had most of what she would need, and figured she would find the rest along the way. After the decision at the table was finished, Erica made sure she had said a special good night to everyone and thanked Henry and Carol again for their kindness. Henry banked the fire and everyone went to bed. Erica lay awake waiting for everyone to fall asleep. From the other room, with only the hay bale walls and blankets for doors, she heard Harold and Betsy making love. 
probably a celebration romp for having arrived safely. But Erica could only picture Vince, his big arms and loving eyes. That was it. She was leaving now. She got up, grabbed her moccasins, and got dressed in some fresh clothes that she had carried with her from the bunker. She put her personal effects in the saddlebags and went downstairs to pack everything up. She ran to the end of the barn where the rest of her supplies were and stopped short when she saw Henry was there. Then she nipped the horse pack onto one of his horses. You can go ahead and put that saddle on that little black mare over there. Her name is Artaz. She will be your new friend for your journey. Since we seem to have a couple of horses too many right now, you can also take this little brown one. His name is Kit, and he will ride well, carry a pack, and even pull a cart. He is steady and will not lose your things, Henry said quietly. Henry, I can't take them. Not two of them. That is way too kind, Erica replied. Oh, yes, you can. How will we feed them all? Take them and put them to good use. They'll get you home quickly and be good friends as well. You can return them later once things have settled down again. Henry said this, but Erica could tell that he never thought for a second that she would be back. Henry silently wondered how far she would make it, but he knew she was strong and had to make this journey. Now I've loaded the goods you had along with some others you will need. You should have enough food, and remember to stay away from people. Carol will be angry as a crocodile getting her eggs stole when she wakes up to find you're gone. But I know you have to go. Henry said this in a sarcastic manner, but Erica could tell that he was choking back tears. Erica snickered as she dug into the pack for something and found it. Here, Henry. I know it's not much, but I want you to have this pack of Marlboros. The only ones gone are the few you've had. I know it isn't much, but they should last a while at least. Erica was digging deep to try to repay him somehow. Well, thank you. That is a gift I will accept. Now get your butt going. Henry was uncomfortable with goodbyes, especially when he didn't want to see that person go. Henry, there's no way I can ever thank you or your family enough. I... I don't know how I could even... Erica was now in tears. Just stop right there, Missy. You don't need to thank me. What goes around comes around in life, and if not in this life, then in the next. We were just hoping to find one body alive out of that mess down there. We knew what we were getting into, and I wouldn't have traded it for anything. You're a good girl, Erica, a strong woman who is totally devoted to the ones you love. This will carry you home and be your light in dark places. You'll get there. Now jump on that horse and ride, Henry was putting finality to the conversation. The goodbyes were over. Erica did as she was told, jumped up on the saddle, and gave Artaz a firm kick to start her journey back to her family. Henry's red hair shined in the candlelight as she rode away. Erica looked back and waved. As Henry waved back to her, he turned to rejoin his wife and try to make some sense out of this backwards new world. He was safe with his family for now, but in this period of uncertainty, he knew it was only a matter of time till danger came knocking at their door. Well, I told you it was going to get exciting at the end of that one because she's finally off and away, headed for home, home, home. So now let's talk a little bit about um, supplies that you should have and um, just your general stocks and things like that. And to talk to us about it today, I have Mr. James Talwage Stevens here, better known as Dr. Prepper. And James Talmage Stevens grew up in post-World War II ex-urban lifestyle that included living by self-reliance principles. His family lived the preparedness lifestyle long before it was considered an attribute. On the farm of his maternal grandfather, they lived pretty much off the land. They played on haystacks and inside barns. They raised chickens, pigs, cows, and raised crops that they could preserve and store. They also raised family-sized crops of corn, sugar cane, peas, beans, carrots, squash, onions, cucumbers, and hot peppers, and don't forget the okra and eggplant. Everything went into a bottle. 
He actually thought food grew in bottles in the dark of the basement till he was seven or eight years old. It was in the late summer after his eighth birthday that he found out how all those fruits and veggies got into those bottles in the basement storeroom. That was the summer his grandmother and his mother determined that he was old enough to learn how to tend the garden, pick the vegetables, and participate in the canning, bottling, and pickling. And hauling the jars to the basement. After several years, their family moved into a larger house on less land farther out of the city. A yard garden, in-home food production, and food preservation continued to be a part of his life until he was in college. In January 1974, he developed Making Best of the Basics, a family preparedness handbook as a post-college project. Now that book is in the 11th edition of Making the Best of the Basics and has been published for this generation, our generation. It's a great book. He's come to the conclusion that it doesn't matter what causes the need. If you're prepared, you need not fear. And he's got some excellent sayings in this book. It is definitely worth the investment. You can reach out and visit James at www.drprepper.com. That's www.drprepper.com. So let me go ahead and welcome James onto the show. Thanks very much for being here with me today, James. It's my pleasure. Good to talk to you, Sarah. So in this chapter, Henry and Carol's son, Harold, makes it to the barn with his family. And they bring some much-needed supplies. But Henry and Carol have a good supply base of their own. Plus, they're growing food and they have livestock. So James, given your extensive knowledge of preparedness information, what are three of the most important things that people should have prepared before they're faced with a long-term survival situation? That's a really good question. That's a tough one. We're all different. And every, you know, over the years, uh, I grew up on a farm. I grew up being provisioned, having to live from harvest to harvest. Uh, it, it was a lifestyle for me long before I went to school. Uh, having been raised during the Second World War, we saw things totally differently because there was a shortage of everything due to the war, war effort. But uh, so in the intervening years since I published my book, Make the Best of Basics, Family Prepared and Handbook. handbook. I've, I've tried to find simple ways to communicate the principles of preparedness because we live by principles. Uh, I don't want to get in. I, I never liked the idea that it's so confusing to so many people and probably the reason why people don't prepare is because we make it so hard. Those of us who are in the business, we worry about uh, 37 ways to use vinegar and 155 things you need to hoard before the poop hits the propeller. All those things are scary. All those things are counterproductive. All those things give you so many, uh, what should we call them, detailed rules that you can't have a life. Uh, it, what is important is that we learn to do more of what we do. Uh, I, I, one of the basic rules is that nobody knows at all about preparedness. Right. Nobody ever has, and nobody ever will. Those are the three rules on which I've built my life. And I'm a learner. I keep learning from other people. And every once in a while, I'll read something, and it has a new paradigm, a new opportunity to grow, or, or, or a new lesson for me. And I'm learning. Every day, I learn some new facts. Uh, it, when you stop learning, you know, you're, we're always dying somewhat, but you, then you begin to be dead. So I, I'm, because we're all different. We all have different uh, family size. We have a mix of our children's sex. We have incomes that are different, the size of our home and the size of our mortgage payment, the number of cars that we have or vehicles, the number of pets, the memberships in organizations, the jobs, how many of them do you have to have to meet, the, you know, to pay your bills, uh, and hobbies. The, the list goes on ad infinitum, actually ad nauseum. So there are so many things we have to consider. And so prepare, there is no the preparedness plan. There is no the list which is primordial for everyone. It's all based on triage. And I've spent years studying this. Finally came up with 15 different categories. We won't go into them here because this isn't germane. But we will look at the ones that you ask, what, uh, what are the, what are the prime ones? Uh, you know, the, the basic ones that you have right. to have. 
and, and everybody really feels this one, and, and I'll say it here, and then I'll get to the lifting. Everybody eats. We don't think so much about drinking water because we live in the United States. Water is everywhere. You can get a drink of water most, most anywhere, or buy a bottle of water, uh, etc. And, and, and it's the thing to do is to have a bottle of water with you. It, it makes you look somehow sophisticated. <laughs> We are spending a fortune on bottled water when it comes right out of the tap, generally speaking. So, given that all families have some kind of have similarities, the responsibility that we have as parents, or as as the homemaker, or as the uh, responsible person. Sometimes we're not a parent; we're just responsible. That <laughs> right. To take care, we have to take adequate care. And, and, you know, we hear all the advertisements and all the pressure to get a gun, get gold, get silver. All those things are, are symbols of wealth, so to speak. But I will tell you this. My father always taught me, he said, son, if I had all the food on earth and he had all the gold on earth, I'd soon have all your food. And, and uh, I'd still have, uh, I'd soon have all your gold. I'd still have a lot of food left over. And I'd have to give you a job. But I'm sure I'd have to fight you because you're so stupid as to think that gold would be salvation for you. You <laughs> see, gold has no meaning if you, go, if you can't buy something with it. Absolutely. And then how do you cut a $2,500 piece of gold in the little pieces to buy a head of lettuce or <laughs> a tomato or right. a bottle of milk so your kids can live? So those are, uh, you know, those are things we have to think of. And, and our, our current society is so frayed and so tattered by the rules that come, are coming down and the changing rules on our personal uh, freedoms, uh, the, uh, the turmoil and tumult that we feel is just driving us crazy. Uh, people, we can still find food. We can still store food. This, if you go buy all the bananas uh, in a store, if, if you could, uh, and, and you could buy them, if you bought them all, don't bring some more out the back. Or they'll have some tomorrow morning because they have a just-in-time delivery system. So this is the greatest country the world has ever known. And yet people are dying of starvation here in the United States. Uh, many scrounging garbage cans and dumpsters and children are going to bed hungry. Uh, and they're going to school hungry. In fact, they have programs to make sure they get nutrition. Yes, uh, sir. But some people do their entire lives in hunger. So you ask me, uh, I, I know that food is power. Whoever controls the food will have the power because it will suck in all the other resources that are available for people to live. So right. my uh, so triage is important. Food is one of, the, one of the things that you have to have. Certainly water is one of the things you have to have. But I think before that, the most important item you have to have, and I think some of the people in your, uh, I, I think you probably dis, uh, you actually exhibited that in your writing without calling it such, but you have to have spirituality. I'm not talking religion. Religion is a set of rules we impose upon ourselves as we feel spiritual. But spirituals, we're spirits with a body. We're not bodies with a spirit. And, and so we're, we're spiritually, we make decisions. It, we, we, we have character. We, we live our lives based on spirituality. So, and and I'm, I'm not saying that it has to be a religious life, but you think of things, you think of consequences, you know, if you can think of a consequence for something you might do, you have you, you have some godliness in you. You have spirituality. Even atheists have spirituality. They may not call it that, uh, but it, it's a it's a neutral term. And what it means is something within you uh, gives you an aspiration, or give, uh, maybe even helps you through desperation. But there is a, a quality within you that wants to be better. The whole purpose of our life is not to be better, me to be better than you and you to be better than me, but for each of us to be better than we were yesterday. So that's kind of how I see spirituality. How do we keep improving so that we become the best we can be? So spirituality is the first driver. If you don't have that motivation, the rest of it is poop. Uh, it's just that simple. So what would come second? Uh, here we start the triage. If you have a spiritual base, the rest of it makes sense. Yeah. So if you are old like me and you can't go more than a certain amount of time without a certain pill, obviously that medical situation is a limiter. You have to deal with that on a first priority basis. Uh, then if you need a little water to quaff it down, okay, that's fine. Water becomes your next issue. But I would think that shelter probably becomes even uh, – if you don't have a medical problem that's, that's, that's critical, then I would say shelter would be the next thing. Why? 
because if you live in Alaska, it's pretty darn important. If you live in Florida, not quite as important, but still important right. in terms of the, because it's not that hot in Florida. It was 105 here yesterday and 85% humidity. Oh. And then it rained. And oh. then it went to 100% humidity. <laughs> and oh, it was man. still 105 degrees. So I have to have shelter. I can't live in that. I, I can work in the morning while it, because you rise and it's about 76 degrees, 78 maybe. Perfect weather. I mean, you know, I can sleep without cover in that kind of weather. It's perfect. You can, you, as long as you don't exert yourself, 78 is the perfect temperature to, to be at. So shelter is important in order to have a stable life uh, and, and to be able to be protected from the elements and to be able to store your stuff. See, that's why shelter is important. Right. Where do you put your stuff? Where do you put your preps? Where do you have so? Uh, where do you put your medication? You have to have some place to put them, and that's in your shelter. Now, shelter includes clothing. Clothing is personal shelter. A uh, shelter generally people think of a house or some kind of shed or something around them. But uh-huh. your clothing is also around. You. Otherwise, you run around naked in the world. <laughs> right. so, um, clothing is part of your shelter. And it has to be considered as part of that. So that, those are the three things you have to consider. But also then you have to think about water because water is critical. People say, you, you, you see, there are so many wags out there who've picked up on the old saw, uh, the rules of th- what they call the rules of three that uh, are out there, three, three, what, three minutes without air, uh, three days without water, three weeks without food. Well, actually, right. at the end of the second day, you become a zombie. You start, you, you, your thinking processes slow down. And if you're in a hot, uh, uh, well, it doesn't matter where you are, your body starts to react or respond to not being properly uh, hydrated. And, and the third day is going to be hell. Uh, by the end of the third day, your body starts, you're, you're, you know, you're starting to shut down uh, parts of your body to conserve the, your brain does it. Uh, automatically, you have no control of it. It's an autonomous reaction. So obviously, having water becomes important. But you know, you could freeze to death in Alaska before you uh, before you need a drink of water if you don't have some kind of shelter. And that's that's what I'm talking about. Triage. You have to look at everything. That's going. Now, if you're in a war zone for whatever reason, uh, uh, you uh, you know. Uh, protection becomes very, very important. You want to stay alive to find a shelter. You see, it's all about mm-hmm. what are the current conditions. And since uh, when somebody says, these are the first priorities, blah, 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 it, it, that's ridiculous. It doesn't even make sense. You have to figure out where you are, what's going on, and what the situational uh, 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 arena is like around you. And then you can talk about food. You can talk about protection, you can talk about knowledge, you can talk about your library, you can talk about homesteading. All those things fall down there somewhere. But you don't worry about planting a garden until you figure out, you know, your shelter. If you, you, those are, are right. you just have to, you have to do the triage. So that's 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 my answer. It's I love your uh, love the spirituality point that you brought in. You know, it's just not something that people talk about very often. And it is really, you have to have that fire. You have to have that drive and that hope or else, yeah, everything else that you have put together, it doesn't matter if you go into a freak out state, you know, if you don't have any any kind of um, fire inside of you. That So I really like that aspect of it. That is not something that you hear people talk about too often, and it's really, it's essential. It helps us see with clarity the reality of the situation. And there's nothing more important to your survival than reality. For example, in America, you know, when everything's going well, we're capitalists. We love the American system. We all feel good, and we're making money. Or we're earning interest on our bank accounts, uh, our savings, and we're making savings, actually, and our jobs, we're growing, etc. We're capitalists when things are going well. Right now, we're becoming socialists. Why? Because we're under stress. Think what happens in the next phase when all of a sudden um, it, it gets, it's getting worse. Uh, and if the things happen that we see that we can forecast happening, we'll be communist country. See, so we denigrate as we have more and more stress and less and less resources. We become more and more imbued with the idea that somebody has to take care of us. I'm right. sorry, that ain't going to fly in preparedness land. You have to learn to take responsibility for you, and you have to take care of you and those for whom you have been given responsibility. And, and I, you know, I kind of threw that in 
but uh, you know, greed and jealousy and lust and and, and just fear and dishonesty become rampant. Yes, as the resources diminish. Yes. And you probably pointed that out in some of you. And yet there are always people who are nice and get taken advantage of. But that's okay. Uh, if that's, if, you know, again, I don't want to take away from those people, but then I'm different perhaps. Uh, who knows? Someone with six kids uh, and, and 600 kids would literally kill for food to keep their kids alive. That's Absolutely. Because the, it's the survival of the fittest or the meanest or the hungriest. Or the dastardly of the <laughs> when it comes down to it, right? Okay, so yeah, that so, brings us right into our next question: Is what are some of the emotional benefits of being able to triage your situation, like you're saying, and have those essentials that you need for your situation for an for an emergency? What kind of emotional benefits are there? I mean, that plays right into the spiritual spirituality conversation that we're well, discussing. You always prioritize your needs. And, and and you asked the question later on, I can kind of put, uh, and I can kind of uh, answer that in terms of we need to, if we've taken responsibility, then we have fulfilled our godly calling, our civil responsibility, and, and our paternal and maternal instincts. We've done it all. You can't do more than that. Right. Uh, so taking responsibility, I think in terms of the best paradigm I think of is, or example is the airplane oxygen mask. If they tell you when you're on the airplane, if the oxygen mask comes down, put one on you before you help your kids. Why? Because if you're not able, the kids going to be harder to deal with. So you take care of you so you can take care of them. So if you prepare you, then you can be part of a community. I am really suspect about community. Uh, we hear everybody, it's all so philosophic. Most of the people who do the writing uh, understand you're two generations behind me. Right. And my, I'm two generations older than you are. I have, I have grandkids. I'm three and four generations older than some of my grandchildren. Uh, and and I, taking care of them requires a lot of resources. Having a preparedness to wrap around them is easier for me because I have more resources I, uh, I can apply to preparedness as opposed to living, I mean, just getting by. So obviously, uh, if you take the airplane oxygen mask as a paradigm, always take care of you so you can take care of others. I don't believe that having a community, having a community is going to require a relationship deeper. It's going to require a spiritual relationship, and it's going to require a kinship that typically you're not going to find in most places. Uh, you know, uh, you need either a really good church group or a really good work group or people who live next door and you pal with them, etc. But it takes a lot of planning to tell someone, I don't have, I have some grain, could you get a grain mill and we'll work out, I, I'll give you, when you grind my grain, I'll give you some of uh, what you grind and blah, blah, you know, those are things that need to be considered and that, uh, the emotional benefit is that you know what you can do. You know your limitations, and you also know the expectations of you. That that gives you a mental security. That gives you a a feeling of not only responsibility but ability to deal with the unknown. By the way, it's not we not only have to be able to deal with the uncertain future. We need to be able to deal with the certain future. And some people, in their normalcy bias, just won't consider that the poop is going to hit the propeller. Right. And it may not be national, it may not be regional, it may not be in the neighborhood. It could be you losing your job or your spouse or the death of a child. Those things, having had all those things happen to me, I can tell you, except my own personal death, uh, I can tell you that all those things take not only emotional, uh, have an emotional cost, they have a physical, they have a physical cost. They cost a heck of a lot of money to, to bury a child. It takes a lot more than... You know, you stumble through it somehow, and you figure out where you're gonna, how you're gonna write that check for ten grand or more. But you do what you have to do, and then you figure out how you're gonna resolve it. That's what pe we need to learn more skills to increase our talents and our abilities and, and our trust, so that we, in ourselves, as much as anyone else, uh, and in our family, in our uh, in our immediate family group, because that's the ones we're gonna be tied to uh, when that situation occurs. So. What is the, the emotional benefit is having a mental security. 
having a confidence that you can and having faith in yourself. Yeah, I love that point that you made that we need to be able to prepare for, you know, that uncertain, but also the certain, like, what is happening today? That's what I tell people. Like, they're like, what are you preparing for? I'm like, life, <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I don't, if something were to happen, I hope that I have the skills, but you know what? I'd have to just face that bridge then, you know, but yeah. today is today. And there's things I need to learn and do to survive now. So I grow a garden because it takes, you know, away from my food bill. I learn how to preserve things and like that and do stuff like that because then I have money to spend in other areas instead of having to dump it all at the grocery store. You know, there's a very simple, there's a very simple rules of three about food, uh, food storage and food, storing food and all those other, and if they can remember this rule, they'll be able to do the work. Remember, you have to have principles. If you have principles, you can figure out the details. So the first principle of food storage is, one, learning how to produce food. Now, part of the problem with, uh, with the preparedness industry is that they're trying to tell everybody, go buy some seeds. Get right. some seeds. And, and do you realize that if you happen to, uh, if the food supply ends in October, it's going to be, you know, April, May before you plant seeds. It's going to be fall before you have food to eat. What do you live on in the interim? Right. The yeah. So you don't wait till the poop hits the propeller to start gardening. You learn now when you can replace those seeds if you botch it. And more than likely, if you're a first timer, you will. Oh, by the way, if you live on the ninth floor of an apartment, why do you need seeds? What are you going to do with them? Yeah. It's just some sprouting seeds that you can put in a jar and grow fresh food right there on your kitchen counter. Even right. a kid can grow sprouts. I mean, right. see, so it's so much broader. The rules, <laughs> all right, so secondly, you need to learn how to prepare food. Whatever you have, and I urge people, store what you eat, eat what you store, use it or lose it. Very simple rule, right? Backup rule. Uh, so how do you prepare food? Well, you want to prepare the food your family uh, and that you already eat. Why? Because there'll be no waste. And if you like it, probably a lot of other people will. So I tell people, I don't care how cheap kale is if you don't like kale, never eaten kale, don't buy it, no, no matter how cheap it is and how <laughs> many can't you get for a buck, because it'll be a wasted, uh, it'd be a wasted investment. So uh, those are the kinds of things that uh, we need to think about. Now, uh, so then we need to learn how to preserve food. We have to have preservation of food. Right. We freeze it. Uh, there are 21 ways to, to preserve food, 21 ways. And uh, some of them are so intensive in resources that they're almost unaffordable. One is uh, freezing food. It is the most expensive way to keep food. Is to yes. Freeze it. And it's the, it's the first way to go. Refrigeration and freezing are the most vulnerable of all kinds. Because uh, yes. if, uh, if you're willing to, to, to take hundreds of pounds of something out of a freezer and go start cooking in the backyard when the lights go out, okay, good luck to you. <laughs> You're just going to tell everybody to come over for dinner, right? Yeah. <laughs> or, or for what else? So, obviously, there are a lot of things you have to consider. Freezing and refrigeration are the most expensive ways. They run all the time, regardless of heat or cold. Right. Uh, so, uh, drying, dehydrating is good. You can do that at home. You can do it in the sun. You can do it in the back seat of your car. You can lay some screens from your windows across the the back seat into the back window, and you can uh, roll the windows up, put them out even most even in winter, and you can dehydrate food, and you can do it very quickly with and you put a sheet under it or something, uh, uh, a blanket or something over the up upholstery of your car, and you can dehydrate food in a day, easily, right. two or three times a day. And so, so you can turn raisins around, in, uh, grapes into raisins in a day. So there's some fantastic. But you need to learn these skills. So those are the things. Now people say, "Well, I don't, I don't have a garden. How do I produce food?" See, that's another one of the myths, or, or one of the promulgations of the industry trying to get people to, to be like them. A few people who may have a homestead, or the people who are copying, pasting, and trending. And that's, uh -huh. I see a lot of trending out there. As you know, you, here's how you produce food. So you live in the city. You get in your car and you go down to the grocery store and you go in with a list of your priorities. You always prioritize. Oh, by the way, and the rule for uh, acquiring food or anything else is never purchase a second, a second uh, priority item until you have purchased your whole category of first priority. So if you want to barter, 
uh, barter with good food. You you can get anything you want. Don't ever think that I'm going to buy liquor and I'm going to buy cigarettes because everybody wants so <laughs> I'll trade for food. Don't be an idiot. Food is everybody eats is the rule. You know, everybody eats. Always have food. You can get all the other stuff cheap because people who want food are desperate, and you can trade with them for all their cigarettes and all their liquor and anything else they have you want. <laughs> I can assure you, if you have food. Uh, I saw it in Europe when I lived there, and I know that darn good and well after, after being in war zones that even a, a candy bar, a stick of gum, is, is salvation to some, to, to some people. So if you don't want to be caught up in uh, buying secondary items until you buy your first item, first primor, uh, your primary items, why? You know, it makes sense. You only have so much money to spend, so spend it wisely, and then you can use it well. So there's one other paradigm that you need, a uh, rule of three, and that is you, you want your home to become, uh, you want to bloom where you're planted. You want to turn your home into a safe place. It, it, it is the place that you're going to protect and live in. You, everything you own is your home. It's your single biggest expense in your life it is to buy a home. Uh, why would you leave it? Why would you grab a backpack and take off unless you had to, unless you had to under orders uh, or unless you were unwisely located in a really bad place? Right. So I've tried to give you, and so in you know, finishing the production, you live in an apartment, you go to the store, you pick out the stuff you want based on the priority you want, you push your cart up to the belt, you put it on the belt, and, and then they give you the number it's going to cost, and you produce your pocketbook, and you produce your credit card or check or, or whatever, and you pay them for the product, and you take it home, your food products, you take it home. You have now produced, hello, you produce food. <laughs> and yeah. you can live for a time on canned foods and stuff like that, because you probably already do, except for the side trips to McDonald's and all the other fast food places and, and convenience stores where you go to buy stuff. So you see, you can produce food even if you don't have a garden. Right. All you have to do is, is, is think about it and, and just do it. That's all it takes. So did I answer that question? Are you okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I actually, I love your outlook on food stores. That's one of the biggest takeaways that I got from your book because they do shove so much of the freeze-dried products and the it's going to last 20 years products down our throat. And so I love hearing your outlook on it, that if you don't eat it, don't prep it. It's not going to be any good. So can you explain to us a little bit of how you came to that conclusion, why you came to that conclusion, you know, why you're just not a big believer of those, all those freeze-dried products and the um, the super shelf-life well, products? Well, I'm, I'm a believer in them. I just don't, uh, and I have some that's 30 years old. I can still open cans of that I bought 30 years ago that have steaks and pork chops that you can't get anymore. But I literally have a couple of cans left of pork chops. I can open those pork chops. I can put those in some uh, in, in a pan, a shallow pan or a pan with shallow amount of water and, and give it three, four minutes, and I'm going to have a fully cooked pork chop ready to eat. Nice. Yeah. Like, I have my own freeze-dry machine. So I believe in all of stuff. And people say, whoa, what are you? yeah, I freeze-dry at home. I freeze-dry my own food. It pays, it's a $4,000 retail price product. I bought it. People say, you're crazy. I said, yeah. What's, and I drive a 1999 vehicle that was paid for, you know, when I paid cash for it. I, I had a 95 truck. I own them. It doesn't matter what gas costs because I don't have any payments on, on, on those vehicles. And the, and the little station wagon, little Ford station wagon gets uh, 35 miles a gallon. I'm happy with that. <laughs> right. And the truck only eight, but I don't drive it very far because I can't afford it. But these are vehicles that I have, I've owned, and I've paid for them. I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Road taxes, 65 bucks a year. I mean, I can deal with that. So uh, making uh, 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 freeze-dried food, and getting back to the subject of food, I produce my, uh, I, I take the food I produce. I can buy green beans. A certain brand has a really good flavor. I can drain the liquid off of them, put them in a freeze-dried machine, and uh, overnight, I have freeze-dried green beans or whatever else that will last now instead of in a can uh, five years. I've got a 25-year life on it, and I can season them like I want to eat them when they come out of the bag. We sit around and eat those things, uh, those veggies, uh, as we watch uh, uh, TV or whatever at night rather than uh, rather than eating expensive cheesy meals, uh, you know, or, or French fries. Right. We eat fresh 
we veggies that are crunchy and good and salted just right, etc. I mean, we take popcorn, and we make popcorn, and then we, without salt, we use uh, um, coconut oil because it won't smoke until it gets really hot. I, I mean, the corn is all popped before it gets that hot. And, and then I, I uh, put uh, dressing, homemade mayonnaise or homemade dressing, and blue cheese dressing or whatever. That's a salad to me. We sit there and eat that while we watch TV. It's fantastic. You know, you Yum. learn to yeah. You learn how to do things. You don't need freeze-dried food, but if you have it, enjoy it. But don't go buy the stuff because it's a Sierra chicken until you taste it because you might not like the Sierra flavor. When I buy when I buy a freeze-dried product that says uh, enchilada, I'm in San Antonio. What are you going to teach me about enchiladas? <laughs> right. <laughs> For heaven's sake, just telling me, go to New York and say, well, show me how to, you know, uh, I'll show you guys how to do a New York steak. I mean, it's a parody on terms. But you right. see what I'm saying. No. Right. Uh, food storage. Store what you eat, eat what you store, use it or lose it. Don't ever buy anything that you're not going to eat and always buy your first priority item so you can trade for secondary items and you can get much more bang for your buck. And you won't starve to death waiting to trade liquor for food. Yeah. See, those kinds of things people need to think about. So, uh, if you don't, uh, as you said, store what you eat, eat what you store, use it or lose it. And when did I come to the realization that you said about... Uh, uh, about the industry proclivity to try to sell you a bunch of uh, a deal. Right. I was I go to a lot of shows. I'm, I'm listening to the pitch, and the guy next to me says, "Store what you eat." Mr. Stevens here says, "Store what you eat." You eat your store, use it or lose it. And then you turn to the guy and say, "You need to buy this 25 year product. It's fifteen hundred ninety five dollars for one person. Put it in your basement when you need it. You got it." So wait a minute. When that rule, store what you eat, you want your store, use it or lose it, where did that rule go? Yeah. <laughs> and they just, I, they just kiss it goodbye. So that's when I began to realize that if you store, uh, again, you know, you're going to bloom where you're planted. So you've got to be able to, to make do with what you've got. But you also have to have an in-home convenience store. Your home has to have an in-home convenience store where you have all the stuff that you like. Those first priorities, those things you really like can be stored, and you can get to them exclusively when you need it. And the other one, of course, is you want them to be able to camp out within the walls of your home. That's very important, that you're able to camp out within the walls of your home with the assets that you have. And it's a safe place to be, and you got more if you need it. If you can do that, you see, you don't have to have hard rules. You just have to know what your goals are. And that's what I see the goals as being. So uh, when I heard those pitches, it began to dawn on it, it slowly the glimmer of light came and said, These, nobody knows at all about prepping. Nobody ever has it. Nobody ever will was the rule. I said, so these people don't know everything either. They're just trying to get a sale because they were selling what uh, they, they were selling what they, we call the salesman's wish. He was trying to sell you what he had to sell at a given price. What's important is that you buy what you need at a price you can afford, when you can afford it, and not go into debt over it. Yeah. So experience. You asked me what gave me the what gave me my outlook on food storage. Experience. Yeah. <laughs> I would, <laughs> that's, that's really. And the more experience you get, the more expensive it is for your food storage. I'll tell you because you make a lot of mistakes. And I've I've bought many many things I thought I would use and didn't. So before you go buy an expensive. Uh, a catalytic heating system for your food. Uh, learn learn how to use a, uh, the you know the fifty dollar uh, cap stove from one of the companies, and then you need to determine if you have a heater, you have a cap stove, you have a lantern. You want to have them all on the same fuel, uh, and so right. you can minimize that. Seems the most expensive is probably the safest. It's the most, but you can buy the little every once every time you go to a camping store or a, a, a box store. If you buy a, one of the little containers of, uh, of propane, you can get a pretty good store of protein, propane. I have a huge propane a propane tank with a thousand gallons. I can fill any bottle I want to from it. So uh, and I have a, I use my grill a propane grill with the you know with the big the white big belly but the uh, you know the, the five they call it the five gallon butane uh, right. or five pound butane. And tank. I have those. 
have several of them, and I use them for my barbecues and things like that. So, you know, you learn to do what you got. You learn to make all, the alternative choices. You make the ones that work for you, and then you can be in control of your food storage. Yes, I wrap around freeze-dried food. I have a bunch of it here. It just came yesterday. I'm trying it out to see if I like it. So I bought some individual packs before I buy the number 10 cans. Today, the trend is to sell uh, packages of one serving, of two servings, of three servings, of four servings. So it, you can invest less more often as you have it instead of buying a whole bunch of it. And they can ship it to you by UPS very inexpensively, and you can have it as you need it. But I, we, uh, I, virtually every day, uh, I eat something I purchase, but every day I eat on my food storage. Everything we have comes through our food storage system, except the milk. And uh, I buy... I'm a country boy. I, I buy my 2% milk at the shelf. <laughs> right. I the, but, I, but I can... It was the other day, uh, I, I was not able to get out of the house. I, I just didn't have the physical strength. I was coming through flu. And so I had to live out of what was in the refrigerator because the, the, the little lady didn't want to drive the car. She wasn't feeling well either. So I ended up drinking powder. I made up powdered milk. It, you know, I just had to make it up a little stronger. I put a little honey in it. And I made it palatable. You know, I'm not going to get hung up uh, on on the recipe for re, uh, for rehydrating milk. Uh, I'm I'm going to make it taste good because I can. And if you practice now using your food storage every day, then you'll be able to deal with any emergency. It'll be just like another day. Right. And I think that's the epitome. That's the epitome of, of being prepared. So I probably take a lot of time, but thank you for allowing me to explicate that. No, that's it's it's the point I wanted to get to as well because it completely um, kind of revolutionized my whole thinking. Like I used to have an area where I put stuff that was saved away for emergency only, and then after reading your book, I was like. Hey, we eat those things anyway. Why am I just like checking the dates? Why not just rotate them into our normal food supply and just keep the whole pantry stocked? Like you say, you know, make it into your own convenience store. That way, if you run out of toilet paper or paper towel, it's right there. If you run out of, you know, beans or whatever, it's right there. And so it told me it, it motivated me to go through and just revamp my whole pantry and just change up my whole system because it just made so much sense to me. Like, why would you keep that back and then worry about dates and worry about it going bad when you could just rotate it through what you're eating anyway? But it made complete okay. sense to me, and it's just something that it's so obvious, but people don't put it so simply. Well, I put the rule in my book in 1974, store what you eat, eat what you store, rotate, rotate, rotate was the third line. And, and people laughed at that. They said, that's so silly. Uh, and so I changed it to use it or lose it because that was more formal. Same <laughs> difference. Right. But location is the key, and uh, people laughed, but they did. But the kids today, the wags who trend, who go out and steal stuff, and, and have no. I, I would I, I would abjure that most of the people who write blogs about prepping have not experienced what they're talking about. Right. I will bet you my. I'll bet you a dollar against a donut hole that most of the people who blog do it for the money or do it because of the popularity or publicity or whatever they get out of it, but most of them have not experienced. And so if I make these little rules, these rules weren't just made up yesterday because you were going to call me. They're made up from lots of experience, uh, and I, I've made every mistake you can make, some of them several times, and I'll still keep on making them because I keep on making decisions. But I'm learning. Right, I'm, learning about supplies. I'm learning about I'm learning about supplies, about the things that uh, are happening, new, tr new products, all those things. But, you know, everything gets back to basic. If you have to crack two stones together, you know, to get a spark to light a fire, Okay, but the, why do we why do we confuse people who are uh, preppers uh, trying to get preppers prepared and we we, we bore, just bore them to tears, drive them crazy with angst about being able to take a boat drill and start a fire? Right. We can buy big ones yeah. for twenty nine freaking cents, and, and you can buy ten of them for three dollars, and you've got a lifetime supply of starting fires under any conditions. I mean, I don't right. get it. Right. But you see. But the more they trend towards the, oh, golly, what do you call it, the ephemeral, 
I guess the more professional they sound. To me, the, yeah. the less professional they are. And and so we see people going from the practical basics, you know, just practical basics to tactical basics. It did this during 1975. It did it in 1999. And it's doing it now. Because the WAGs, I call those the wrong agenda group, the WAGs, grab a bit of the truth and start propounding it, and then they start embellishing it. And the reason why they do is because it's all new to them. And so it all sounds good. They can make it up as they go because it sounds good. Actually, a lot of it's so insane and so inane that anybody with any experience would say, are you kidding me? But it's out there, and there are people blogging every day, and these people and the trends are getting deeper and deeper. One week is how to you know how to start a fire with a bow drill. The next is five fifty paracord. The next is a water purifier, straw, or right. this. And everybody goes with it, and they all they all copy whatever the manufacturer says about their product, and 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 the truth somewhere gets lost in the communication. Yeah, and that's why, you know, the two things I want to say about that. That's why I find the resources of gentlemen like yourself, gentlemen like James Hart, just so valuable because why try and recreate the wheel? You guys have already been through it. You've already experienced these things. So why not go and pick the brains of the experienced ones who know what to expect, who know, who've, who've lived it, who has, you know, been through it. So that's why I find so valuable there, um, your input. And also, um, you know, you can, you can definitely watch the trend. So that's why it's not preparing for, you know, a certain survival situation, but it's just getting ready. It's just thinking about life how you can do things a little bit simpler. I mean, look, they just passed a law. We don't even know where our meat's coming from anymore. So if you can get out to your local farmers that are right outside of your city and you know right where your meat's coming from, you can form a relationship with those people, that's called survival now. You know, that's putting better meat on your table and stuff now instead of going, oh, well, if stuff hit the fan, then I would go out to that farmer then. Well, why not do it now, you know? And then we're helping fellow Americans, those people who want to be out there raising the animals and things. We're giving them a life. We're giving them our money for their product, which is exactly what they need to keep doing what they're doing. So, those, you know, those are some big aspects of, you know, what you're talking about as far as people just going on the money train. And that's why, you know, I really, um, I wrote my book. It was just a fictional novel. I'm not really out there looking for money from anything. I just want to raise awareness and get people in thinking about, you know, there's things outside of our door that we can eat that we've lost the knowledge of. There's things we can grow in our garden that we're losing the knowledge of how to do that nowadays. So that's why it's so important to not forget and to be able to pick the brains of gentlemen like yourself and, you know, females and, and everybody so that we have these skills that my, from my generation, my grandparents possessed that we got on a computer and decided we didn't need anymore. Mm. So, you know, that's kind of my mission. <laughs> You're right. But right, experience, that's, that's the bottom line. We right. need experience, and as we have more experiences, we'll get smarter, <clears throat> and we'll start acting better and making better decisions, and that's really what, what it's all about. about. All right, James, well, we're going to have you back for episode 22, so let's go ahead and say say la vie for today. It's been a pleasure having you on the show, and I can't wait to have you back for the next episode. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good to talk to you. A very special thank you to James Talmadge Stevens or Dr. Prepper for being on the show. Remember, if you want to find him, you can find him over at www.drprepper.com. And a link to that will appear on the show notes. So if there's one quality in this world that I really admire and respect, it is honesty. Honesty is always the best policy, in my opinion, and that is all you are going to get out of James. So... Props to him, and thank you very much for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. And I want to thank you for spending your time with me. I always love having you here. Remember, you can go over and leave a review over at iTunes. You can go out and leave a review for my book. It would be great over on Amazon. And until next time, I want you to go out and dream, survive, thrive. 
Thank you for joining Sarah for this episode of the Changing Earth Podcast. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Day After Disaster at www.authorsarahfhathaway.com. If you love this podcast, please head over to iTunes and let everyone know by leaving a review.